So, um, yes, just to uh, make it clear to everyone, uh, this is um, my, my name is Ben Cat, and I'm the uh, training officer at Open Air. And so Open Air is a not for profit, and we're doing this really just to uh, help the research community. Um, the speakers that you'll be hearing from are Jonathan England and Julia malik -Wernera, and they're also uh, from Open Air, um, my, my colleagues indeed. Um, Jonathan, he, uh, sorry, they are the uh, Horizon Europe policies requirements uh, for uh, Open Air, uh, sorry, Open Access and DMPs, which is the first topic that they will be speaking about. Julia will then move on to Open Research Europe and uh, some tools that you can use. And then finally, Jonathan will go back to Horizon uh, Europe grant proposals. So hopefully what you'll uh, learn about through the course of this session is uh, mandatory and recommended open science requirements in Horizon Europe, uh, compliance with the Horizon Europe open access to publications mandate, managing and sharing research data in uh, Horizon Europe projects, delivering data management plans and reporting publications and data sets in Horizon Europe, and open air tools and services to support uh, Horizon Europe projects. And we're mainly aiming this at project coordinators, researchers, research managers, li uh, librarians, and data stewards. But indeed, if you don't fall, fall into that, then um, I'm sure this will be of interest to you as well. So without further ado, I am going to uh, pass on to Jonathan. Uh, please take it over. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I'm sick, so um, hopefully everything will uh, will be all, all right. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. So as Venkat said, I'll first be talking about the requirements in Horizons Europe, uh, propose, um, not proposal, in, during the project and after the project. Um, so in so the slides are already online. You actually have at the bottom of the of the page the um, the URL link to uh, on the node. Um, and this slide is just a, a list of the all the different documents that you might need uh, during the uh, uh, in terms of urban science for for your projects. Um, so. I'm not going to go into details about what open science is, but in terms of the um, European Commission, obviously there's a lot of emphasis on open access to publications, on data management, um, but there is a new dimension with Horizon Europe, which is a bit different that if you knew about the um, H2020 projects, there's an inf emphasis on um, adding information about other types of uh, output outputs, tools, instruments to validate um, the results of the data. So first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, publications and then I'll talk about uh, data management. So this is quite similar to H2020 with a very important distinction is, so you still have to deposit all your um, you need to make available in open access all your publications, um, but this time you need to deposit them on a repository and they need to be immediately available in open access. So you're not allowed to have a, what we call an embargo period on, on, your, on your open access anymore. There's also a strong emphasis on licensing this time, which has to be that I will go back on to what CC BY is a bit later. Um, but just so you know that at least the um, your your manuscript needs to be uh, one of the versions of your manuscript needs to be under a CC BY license, meaning that you as an author retain your rights. So just um, a few words on the different versions of, of your manuscript. Um, when you submit um, your, your paper to, to a journal or to a platform, it gets peer reviewed. And the final version of, the, um, of your paper becomes what we call the author accepted manuscript, which is what I call the ugly version basically of your paper, because it's 
the same content as the very final version, but it's just not copy edited by the uh, by the journal. That version, which is the prettier version, is the version of record. So in terms of open access, whether it's the author accepted manuscript or the version of record, it doesn't matter. One of them needs to be uh, available in open access. Um, so on the papers, on the manuscripts, you also need, as I said uh, just before, you need to uh, include information about all those other research outputs or tools to validate the, the conclusions. And also some, sometimes um, people forget, and that's really important um, to add is the acronym or the code of the, the project really. The difference in terms of um, H2020, and uh, if you know also about, if you're um, funded by a, uh, a funder that is part of Coalition S, that's like Plan S, uh, it's a bit different. It's less restrictive than Plan S. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that it, it just it doesn't matter. Um, so, in terms of the European Commission, you are allowed to um, claim the open access fees that you pay for uh, publishing in a full open access venue. But if you're using a non-full open access, so usually we call those hybrid journals, where it's a traditional journal that gives you the uh, option to publish in open access, meaning that some of the papers are in closed access. You need to pay mem membership to be able to read them and others are in open access. Um, those are not reimbursable. So if you, you can still um, publish in those, but if you do want to pay for open access, then you would have to find the, the funds somewhere else. You can't use the, um, the um, Horizon Europe grants for that. So one thing that I want to really emphasize is, as I said, with the different versions that the author accepted manuscript is really the, the, the minimum. Um, as soon as you deposit on, uh, on a repository, you are compliant and you make it available in open access, you are compliant with the European Commission's requirements. You do not need to publish and pay open access fees to make it available in, in open access. You can check uh, a journal's eligibility with the journal checker tool. Um, on the decision tree there that um, you can see there's some, I'm, I'm not going to go into details about what's the um, rights retention strategy, but just so you know, it's um, a way to make sure that at least your author accepted manuscripts, so the ugly version of your, of your manuscript gets um, a CC by license. And as soon as you get a CC by license, you're allowed basically to deposit wherever you want and make it open access. So there might be uh, two different licenses, one for the author accepted manuscript and one for the version of record. Um, I will, well, Julia will go back onto that, the Open Research Europe, which is the European Commission's um, own um, publishing platform. Just so you know, this is done automatically, this uh, archiving. So if you go that route, you have even less uh, work to do, but it's not mandatory. In terms of research data, um, it's very similar to what was before with H2020. You still need to follow what we call the FAIR principles, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, I'll go very briefly about um, around them, but it's something that needs a bit more um, explanation. So. If you don't know um, at all what it is, I would recommend having a look at other guides so, um, so you get a bit more familiarized with, with it. In terms of the requirements, you need to create a data management plan um, by month six of the beginning of the project. Then you, because it's a living document, you need to update it mid-project, at least once during the project and at the end of the project. 
you need to deposit any data and metadata. So metadata is any uh, information that is attached to, to your data. So for instance, if you have a music file, uh, the author, the title, the year of publication, and all this, all this data that is attached to your music file is what we call metadata. As soon as you produce it or generate it, you need to um, up deposit at least the metadata so that people can find your, um, your data online. They might not have access to it um, because finding, depositing it doesn't mean that you make it open access, but it, at least it's findable. Um, there is a mention you will see quite often that the metadata for um, data repositories needs to be on the CC0. When it is a trusted repository, most of the time it is they do share in metadata in CC0, so you don't need to, um, to think too much about that. And again, as I mentioned um, in my first slide, is you need to add some detailed information about other research outputs, tools, instruments. So depositing your data and making it findable for others to, um, to find, it doesn't mean that you need to open it. Um, so there are some, but you need to always justify it, especially in the data management plan, you need to justify why you will not be opening the data. So it could be commercially valuable data, uh, especially if you're working with um, a commercial company also alongside, uh, there might be some privacy issues and or security issues that are linked to, to the EU. So as long as you justify why you're not opening the data or not why you're not opening the data immediately, then uh, that usually is accepted by the, um, by the European Commission. Okay, so I'm going to give you an overview of uh, a few elements that I had mentioned before and uh, that might not be obvious. Uh, trust, when I talk about trusted repositories, so remember that when I was talking about um, publish, um, depositing your publication and your data in a trusted repository, there are some rules uh, linked to that. So there's some technical elements which you don't need to know. Basically, if you're looking for publications, you would be looking on the website Open Door for data, more read-through data. And if you don't find any uh, subject specific, so in your field of research, one that is closer, um, you would uh, you can always deposit on Zenodo, which is a generic open access repository for publications, data, presentations, and that. that's where, for instance, this presentation is uploaded on. I want to emphasize also that um, there's a big element of what the EC called endorsed by the international research community. As long as a repository follows all the different uh, elements that make it a trusted repository, it is uh, really important to favor those uh, repositories that are trusted by um, your peers in your field of, um, of research, because this is where other people that do similar research will deposit. So it makes more sense to deposit them rather than Zenodo. Uh, but again, if you don't have a repository in your field, then obviously you would uh, you can always deposit on, on the node. Creative Commons is a type of open license, so it is still a license, so it's still um, a legal framework. So you're still protected, your work is still protected under international law, um, but it makes it uh, explicit what others can or cannot do with your work. So most of the time, um, your publications, at least the author accepted manuscript, will be on the CC BY license, meaning that people can do whatever they want with your with your work as long as they cite you. Um, and for data, for different reasons, which I won't go into details uh, today, but it's usually uh, CC0, which is like um, a public domain license. Um, 
there are some reasons behind this, but um, it's, it's still accepted by the EC that you deposit on the CC BY. Now, in terms of what a data management plan is, it's a formal living document, meaning that it's not something that you write at the beginning of your project and then just never touch. It's something that you will keep updating if there are some new developments, if there are people added to the project, if you decided that a repository is not the best anymore. All those um, different reasons would lead to an update of the, of the DMP. What it does, it basically tells the funder that you know what you're doing. Um, it, you're going to outline basically what you're going to, your data management strategy um, during the project, after the project in terms of sharing and in terms of um, archiving. The issue with a DMP is that there's no absolute right answer. It's really detailing why you decided uh, of um, why you took this decision of using this specific tool over another one. So as long as you're very clear, specific, and detailed, project officers tend to, um, um, to be OK with it, as long as you explain why and you justify it. Um, and as I said before, your data needs to be as open as possible, as close as necessary, which is the, the FAIR principle. Um, linked to the fair principles. So meaning that if you can make it open, then great, but you don't have to, but you would need to justify why. So fair principles, there's a lot of things that we can say in terms of a DMP and for the sake of you understanding what it is. Um, for each letter, I'm going to give one specific example that you need to um, um, bear in mind. So in terms of findable, you want to add what we call a persistent identifier. You might have an ORCID ID, uh, which is your persistent identifier, your unique identifier for um, you as a researcher. And usually, uh, repositories give a DOI, which is a unique uh, URL, basically. Um, so most repositories will give you that, that uh, DOI, and you should be using that, um, because if the URL behind it ever changes, that DOI will never change. You will always forward to the latest um, version of the, the data. In terms of accessible, you need to deposit on a trusted repository because there are some automated ways of making the data open. So there's a, if it's a closed data, it's still uh, or restricted, you can still um, make it available in an automated way. Putting your data, uh, putting a statement, for instance, saying that the data will be made available if uh, you send an email to the author is not accessible because what happens to the author if they they pass away? You know, if you know nothing, uh, you don't have access to to the data. So that's why we want to deposit them on on a repository. Interoperable, we want to have standardized file formats. So the basic example is instead of having the proprietary Excel and um, XLSX uh, file format, we would recommend changing it to a CSV file format. Uh, and reusable, meaning that other people will understand what all the variables are, what when it when everything was um, the data was created, how it was created, and all that. So it's well documented, which is similar to readme files, and you include also um, all that extra information that is needed to really comprehend the the data. There are some specific cases um, which uh, became really relevant with uh, the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, in the European Commission can ask you to, if they trigger a public emergency, um, 
they they might ask you to make available in open access immediately any uh, publication or any research output basically uh, as soon as possible so you would need to deposit immediately as soon as you get your data you would need to deposit it on Zenodo for instance and make it open available which is what happened a lot of the time during the uh, in 2020 and 2021 a few words on reporting and monitoring um the the european commission will um you will have a project officer attached to, to your project and they will be monitoring all these elements those requirements for the um, for your project they will also be looking at your dmp and asking for uh, updates if you're at already this stage when you're on the ec participant portal i'm just going to mention this because you will have all those slides so it's i'm adding a lot more information on the slides just for future reference um if it's not relevant for you right now you can just um, um skip that there are three main types in terms of urban science which is the publications um the data sets and the other results so on the ec partisan portal you will have at the bottom of the, your your page all the publications are listed in with your project and you will have all these suggest, suggested publications from open air so open air is a lot of uh, things it's you know we do training but it's also a technical infrastructure that links a lot of um, research objects um, between each other so that's why you will see uh, those uh, suggested publications if it is the case then you would click on it and um, you might not be able to see really well on on the slides but it will ask you if a version of your manuscript was put in open access and then it will ask specifically for the PID um, of your that was given by the publisher and then it will ask for PID sorry is the person identifier so the the DUI given by the publisher and then the DUI where the um, where you deposited where you archived your your work so publish a version of record for instance in terms of data set it's the same thing um it will also ask you the, the same type of questions you will have also this uh, suggested data sets because of the links so that's why it's really important to add the acronym in your publications and then results and other results is for all those other elements that I was talking about in my first slide, which is everything that is linked to your project. And now we'll go to, um, I'll give the floor to Julia to talk about the um, European Commission's um, publishing platform. Um, would you like uh, me to share the screen or uh, do you want to go? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, just a sec. So I have too many bars here. <laughs> um, I can't see. Okay, here. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Jonathan. Okay. Um, so Open Research Europe is a publishing platform, so it's like a journal, but it's a modern way to see the journal because everything now is digitalized. And uh, in any case, you have, uh, as researchers, so you have uh, all um, the credit that you usually have when you publish in a classical uh, uh, journal. So Open Research Europe is a publishing platform and not an archive. This is, has to be clarified as there was uh, many um, difficulties to understand uh, this point. 
So what does it mean? Uh, this uh, is a diamond open access publishing platform for uh, um, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe beneficiaries, and also those uh, uh, who, are from, uh, who are funded from Euroton. It was launched uh, in March 2021. Uh, it is a high quality, reliable, efficient, and transparent uh, uh, platform in which all the processes are uh, uh, open and transparent. There is no cost for the authors or the readers because all the costs are covered by uh, the European Commission. Uh, it's uh, very uh, nice because you can also see the peer review comments and you can understand uh, what is the difference between the preprint version and uh, the uh, second or uh, the third version, as long as uh, uh, the uh, article is uh, fully accepted. It also provides an immediate publication. But uh, uh, the interesting part of Open Research Europe is that uh, uh, you have a, a preprint uh, uh, check. Uh, you can publish uh, several uh, research outputs. And since uh, there was a question about this, uh, we will go, um, we'll, uh, we'll explain this further. Uh, and uh, um, there is also a new way to um, show the metrics that are for the article. In particular, it's more on the type of download and uh, uh, how many downloads there are. Uh, everything is uh, indexed uh, in uh, uh, Google Scholar and uh, on Scopus. And uh, now I will explain a little bit more uh, the way uh, of um, uh, the way of uh, publishing uh, so you submit the article there is uh, uh, there is a preprint version that uh, will be available since the beginning uh, and it it's uh, coming after a check in any case from uh, the editorial team from uh, f1000 uh, who is uh, offering uh, um, the the help with the platform and then there will be an open uh, peer review in which uh, the reviewers are invited either uh, by suggestion from uh, uh, the uh, author or uh, uh, the author can choose who uh, the who you would like to review your article and uh, after the peer reviewing, uh, you can uh, resend the update version and uh, everything will be again uh, published um, both in the platform and also archived in Zenodo. Sorry, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so Jonathan explained before how the preprint process uh, is working. So you have a draft, a submission, a peer reviewing, and then a revision again. So the preprint is an article that has not uh, yet passed the peer review. Uh, once it's accepted, you have uh, the final publication. The article that... Uh, um, are accepted in uh, Open Research Europe uh, can be different. Can be case studies, uh, can be research articles, brief report, but uh, we can also have a new uh, possibility like a data note, which is an explanation of uh, uh, the data sets that uh, you are producing, a method articles, which can link uh, the methods and uh, can help uh, the uh, reusability of the data and uh, um, to redo your same uh, work and uh, maybe expand in uh, other contexts. An open letter, uh, software tool articles, an explanation of the software that uh, you are producing, a review article, a case report, uh, these are classic, uh, register report in which you are explaining uh, the article that uh, you are, uh, the research that you are uh, registering, 
clinical practice articles, study protocol, systematic review, and also essay for social science and humanities and arts. So it covers different types of study for different subjects. So the pre-publication checks, as I said before, um, is uh, an important key point uh, of publishing in Open Research Europe because there is an in-house editorial team that will help you uh, to revise the text and uh, meet the guidelines, check any kind of plagiarism, uh, check the data availability, and uh, um, that everything is uh, conform uh, to high-quality publication. Uh, the open peer review is another uh, nice key point and you can also uh, uh, subscribe to be a reviewer and uh, um, it's uh, it's very interesting because th it's an opportunity for uh, uh, expand your networking uh, the open peer review can be cited uh, it's an opportunity for collaboration and also to uh, empower um, to lead the process. And uh, um, what is uh, seen is that everything uh, is uh, um, less biased and there is a very improve of, uh, on the quality of the peer review. Uh, the probable status uh, uh, you can find in any, uh, in any articles. You will see uh, this uh, tick point as approved, uh, the question mark if there are any reservation or the X mark if it's not approved. Uh, so this is how it will look in the final publication. If it's a waiting for peer review, if uh, uh, there are uh, um, reports and everything is uh, written close to the uh, title. And uh, again, in the example, you will be able to access uh, to see how many version uh, there are and uh, if everything is approved. Uh, how to submit? Uh, the submission proce process is very uh, easy and simple. Uh, as you can see here in the GIF, uh, you can uh, uh, write the article type, the title, uh, the information on the keywords, uh, write an abstract that can be easy to understand also for no uh, scientific public. And also you can give the uh, credit taxonomy, uh, so the right uh, um, uh, role that each uh, uh, authors have contributed in the um, article. If you want to know more about Open Research Europe, you can scan here the QR code and get subscribed to the newsletter. Now I will the uh, um, I would like to give you an overview also the open air uh, service that uh, will support you uh, during the uh, Horizon Europe project. And also connected with uh, the uh, Open Research Europe platform. So as I said before, there is also the possibility to publish a data notes. Uh, it means that uh, uh, you can uh, um, in different stage of uh, your uh, uh, research work, you can uh, still uh, publish and uh, collect uh, um, report and articles that are uh, peer reviewed and that have uh, the quality and the standards for being uh, easily cited, but also for giving a scientific uh, impact uh, on the research that you are doing during the time. Uh, there are four steps to publish in open data that are very easy, which are prepare, select, and uh, uh, add your uh, data statements in uh, your articles, and then link everything uh, together in uh, your article. Here are my tips and tricks for data management. Uh, first, uh, plan uh, your data. Uh, there was a question in the chat about uh, the new template uh, in uh, Argos, uh, you will find uh, uh, Argos is a data management plan uh, tool, uh, which is machine actionable and anytime you would like, uh, you can update and add the new data sets, so it's very handy uh, 
it's not just for the deliverable of the six months that uh, uh, is mandatory, but also you can start writing uh, your uh, DMP uh, before the proposal. There is a short version that we present in our community call in uh, September. And uh, if you need uh, assistance, feel free to email me and uh, to email uh, Argos uh, for any kind of support that uh, you need. Uh, the data management plan is uh, um, it contains information about uh, your research and the document the documentation of research data sets that was explained before by uh, Jonathan. Another interesting uh, tool uh, that we have uh, in open air is amnesia. Uh, it uh, helps uh, you to anonymize the, the data. Um, and uh, um, uh, and uh, it's um, basically you can download the um, you can download the um, uh, the software, and you can check what are the sensitive data that uh, you would like to um, anonymize uh, or to protect for privacy issue. Then uh, we have uh, um, uh, increased the, um, we have here what to do and what to don't do for uh, um, sharing uh, your data sets. And uh, after uh, uh, this, uh, you can uh, uh, download the presentation and uh, go in, deep, in depth to this do and not do. And you can also find these guidelines in Open Research Europe for Authors Data Guidelines. Uh, then, as it was said before, also for data sets, you can deposit uh, the, uh, your data sets by using uh, um, either the uh, Either you can search for data repository in the Retrie data, or you can ask to the librarians of your institute for helping and guide you to their service that are already present in the institutes, uh, or a search as uh, Jonathan was mentioned before, uh, something that is more discipline specific, which will help, uh, the, uh, help you to be cited and to have a much more recognition on the work that is similar to you, to your uh, process, and they can increase again your collaboration and the career uh, in the case uh, you uh, are in the early stage of the career. And uh, uh, also you can find other uh, repository uh, in Explore. Uh, where is written uh, deposit. Explore is another open air service for uh, search and discovery. Uh, you can uh, add uh, a data availability statement in your article in Open Research Europe, for instance, in that uh, kind of uh, article, which is called data note, and is uh, a statement that uh, uh, should be added uh, to the end of the article before the submission. You can also mention the DMP if it's published on Zenodo or in another repository, and you can provide the DOI in the uh, data availability statement of your article. Then you can make uh, links and uh, contextualize your uh, data in Explore. Uh, Explore is uh, an open air services um, in which uh, at the tab that is uh, uh, link, you can find uh, the resources and you can also proceed in linking uh, different entity, entities and uh, summarize and finish. If uh, you are part of uh, an Horizon project, you can also link uh, all the data and uh, uh, the articles and uh, the metadata um, to your, uh, um, to your uh, um, uh, project. So when uh, we are speaking about a research product, uh, uh, we are speaking about any kind of things that is related to the research project that can be 
uh, articles, data sets, can be presentation, can be posters, uh, anything that you can uh, link to the repository, even software that you can add in the repositories, even GitHub. In Explorer, you can link uh, the, your software where you are publishing in the archives. You can link uh, anything from uh, GitHub's. You can link also to your Orkit. So everything should be together. And uh, uh, whenever you are going uh, to Sigma to report in uh, the documents, uh, Everything should be already there. If it's not, again, you can go back to explore and make sure that the link is there. And now I will give the floor back to Jonathan. Thank you. Sorry, I had lost myself. <laughs> I couldn't find the tab anymore. Um, thank you, Julia. Let me just share again. And I don't know who's scribbling on the screen, but. So, sorry. Ugh. Is there no way to? Okay, sorry. Wait, let's wait. I thought there would be a way to present from a different slide. Yeah. So now I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, open science uh, part in grant proposals. Yeah. Uh, if you've uh, already written. Um, uh, or looked at the grant proposal in Horizon for Horizon Europe. Um, it is one of the pillars of um, the European Commission, so they do emphasize a lot. Um, here, for reference, you have the different parts of where um, uh, specifically they ask for um, something linked to, um, to open science. So in terms of publication, um, so, so I'm not going to go into details. I'm just going to give you tips for, for, for writing because obviously each proposal will be very different, uh, but there are some elements that are common to, to everyone. In terms of your publication, they need, so any publication that you not cite needs to be in open access. And we mean open access without embargo. So it needs to be on a repository um, in open access. Obviously, we're in um, we're you know research uh, evaluation. A lot of funders, a lot of uh, research organizations are trying to move past the impact factor. Um, the European Commission being one of them, so they do not evaluate on um, quantitative uh, metrics. They do. Uh, it's really the qualitative aspect of the publication that you will mention that will uh, factor in. You can also give insights into where you're hoping to publish or whether you want to be using the Open Research Europe, but you know, bear in mind that that's not mandatory. It's there for you if you want to, um, but you are still uh, allowed to, um, to publish wherever you, you want, or if you're um, looking into publishing in a full open access journal. In terms of data, it's a similar aspect that any data that you cite needs to be fair so it doesn't necessarily mean to be open because you could give um, specific limited access to the reviewers during that time period but they still need to be fair so you know having the documentation having a doi um, having all these elements that make them uh, fair the EC also asks you for something that I find is very similar to, to the MP. So they say that it's not required, but they ask you kind of the same questions. 
So even though you're not writing a DMP, you have to ask yourself those questions as if you were writing a DMP from the beginning. It's like a mini DMP. So um, you still need to ask all those questions that was uh, that are linked to to a DMP. You still need to um, uh, to ask yourself uh, those questions and to to be specific, basically, and and. Uh, outline what you're going to do during the project and after the project. Um, one specificity also is that there needs to be a, de a dedicated work package on project management that includes a DMP as a deliverable. Um, so in the things that are eligible under the, the, the budget that you ask, you can ask to do in the grant. And I would re highly recommend adding because Asking more money for open science elements is actually a plus because you're going, you're proving that you've thought about things. So, for instance, if you any data creation costs, if you need to pay, if you, if you get um, really big data, and so you need to get a specific uh, a storage space for dedicated storage space for that. That is. Um, uh, well uh, created, then you're showing also that you've put some thoughts about what's happening during the project and after the project. And so you're asking for more money, but you're showing that you know what you're you're doing. So um, it is one of those elements that uh, can be um, it is not um, it is also showing that you're um, you thought about open sites. Obviously, you can ask for um, open access uh, fees and anything that is engaging uh, citizens. Uh, so citizen science, um, this is also more and more uh, prevalent in, um, in uh, with Horizon Europe. So as I said before, when talking about the DMP, but it's the same kind of rules uh, for project proposals is to be spe as specific as possible. Don't, project officer will not dig for the information at the, um, or not even project officer, sorry, this is the um, mistake, but the reviewers will dig for the information. So you have to really uh, lay it there for, for them. Um, so as long as you're specific uh, about your choices, then you're more credible in terms of your, your proposal. One thing that I see a lot also um, that's valid, uh, not only doing proposals, but also in DMPs, I see uh, a lot of researchers explaining what open access is and what fair data. And so it's nice because you get 12 pages of um, <laughs> this explanation, but all of this is um, useless because the people that are reviewing obviously know what open access, open sciences, so you don't need to, to do that. Focus really on your actual project. Um, I want to mention the ERC and the Marie Curie um, funding. They are slightly different, uh, especially for the ERC that has no uh, explicit evaluation uh, on open science criteria. Um, but it will never be a negative. It will always only be a positive thing to, to, to add to it. It does, uh, however, require you to have a, a DMP uh, as a deliverable. Marie Curie is very similar to the, um, um, the other um, Horizon Europe um, funding. But there's an uh, element also on um, uh, training activities, career development plans uh, as key transferable skills um, to use open science, not just for the project, but how are you going to use open science for building up that individual that is getting that uh, Marie Curie uh, funding. Uh, so there's an added uh, layer to, to that in, in the proposal. Um, I'm not going to go through the open science recommended practices. So just so you know, um, open access to publications, sorry, so open access to publication, um, research data management and mandatory. 
but the EC does also um, recommend a lot of uh, of the um, open science practices. I would highly recommend going through them. And if you see something that is relevant to your project, definitely highlight it because it's something that will um, impact positively. So it will never be impacting negatively if you don't do them, but it will definitely add to your to your proposal if you're um, if you're doing them. Um, yeah, so elements such as pre-registration, which is basically where you're depositing uh, your, well, your, yes, you're depositing um, your study plan in advance before doing the, um, the, uh, the, the study itself. Uh, preprints, which is similar to Open Research, what Open Research Europe does, where you deposit um, and make it available your manuscript immediately, even before peer reviewing. And any type of uh, public engagement and citizen science will be highly valued. So just to finish on all this, I know it's a lot of elements, especially if uh, you're just discovering this. Um, don't worry, there's a lot of different elements that are linked to, to open science. Um, and what I want to really emphasize is that you should really design an open science strategy. Whether it's from the beginning, it's like learning the fair principles. You know, that could be your first uh, element of the strategy to understand where you're going in terms of those open science requirements. Um, so really include where uh, publication and data will be uh, deposited and who is responsible for it, because that's uh, a lot. Um, an issue a lot of the time is that it's not explicit who's doing what. And then if, especially if you have projects that are with uh, different um, you know, research organization, other just assume that the others are going to take care of it. So always be explicit um, and really keep track of all the issues you're getting. And uh, you can always discuss it with the project officer. Uh, or with other um, people that are linked to open science, like open air is. Okay, so um, that's it for the uh, presentation part. And now we'll just answer any question that you may have. I, th I think there's already quite a few. In... Yeah, we've been trying to keep on top of the questions here in the chat window, but there's uh, plenty more, Jonathan, I think that can be covered as well. Um, I think maybe one of the questions that seemed to have most interest was about licensing. And basically, I think there was, well, there was one comment uh, indeed that said that uh, researchers don't know how to apply licenses and um, the, the actual process in doing that. And also about um, CC0 and CCBY. Okay, those are the most open ones, but um, it seems to be that uh, there's some experience amongst the audience here that they've seen more restrictive licenses uh, being used in, in their uh, research communities. Uh, and I don't think these are being done uh, in a justified manner. Maybe you can comment on this. Yeah, so licenses is, I would say, a difficult topic, especially for researchers. Even me, for instance, I have no legal background. I had to learn a lot of things linked to um, licensing and open licenses in, in general. Because of that lack of knowledge, people tend to use more restrictive uh, licenses. Um, I mentioned that there are some reasons why we use CC0 for data. So um, maybe I can just give you an, an explanation of this really briefly, but um, there is a whole reason. So for instance, for publication, CC BY is fine because we it's kind of the same as we already do. We cite other researchers for their publication. 
for data, there's a lot of uh, each uh, element that is restrictive. So for instance, in the Creative Commons, you have uh, the non-commercial, you have the non-derivatives, meaning you're not uh, allowed to modify the, um, the data. Uh, and then you have the share alike. In terms of the non-commercial, there's a lot of issues because uh, the, from a legal point of view, what is considered commercial is very loose. Um, and so there are things that, um, just a stupid example, you're giving a talk to, um, to a conference and you're using data from someone else and uh, you're being paid for it, even a, a minor fee. That would be considered as a commercial um, action, for instance, and so you would not be allowed to, to use that data. So that's why, for instance, we try and uh, avoid non-commercial because it has a lot of uh, implications linked to it. Non-derivative means that you can't change the data at all, this meaning that from a point of view of a researcher trying to build on uh, someone else's work, it's useless because you're not allowed to modify it. Um, and share alike is uh, kind of like what I call a, a virus type of uh, creative commons where you're forcing the other um, the the other researchers to share in exactly the same license. So if you had CC by share alike, the others would have to share uh, with the same license. The issue with that is that you might be merging different um, data sets that have different licenses. And that means that if there's one that has CC by share alike, it can be a real problem um, for, um, for sharing that, that data. That's why we always tend to favor uh, CC0. Um, um, yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, again, um, Anna, um, I think who started this conversation, um, they've just uh, written a, another comment saying the justification I often hear from researchers is that their research is publicly funded, so they don't want commercial entities to profit from it. So if it is publicly funded, then it should be uh commercially reusable actually the the whole point of publicly funded research is that uh commercial entities because we, we we have to i understand that we we think about commercial entities as some time a bit evil you know uh, but a lot of things uh happen thanks also to commercial entities that have the money and the time to dedicate specifically to that and so advance progress on that in a different way that researchers do. Um, so if it is publicly funded and the European Commission does say that quite clearly with, uh, with what they're asking in terms of requirements, it should actually be reusable commercially, definitely. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I hope that satisfies most of the, the answers there. I just want to point out we're at the top of the hour, but we're going to continue here because we do have a, quite a few questions that um, maybe we really would like to get through. So feel free to stay on, but uh, I understand if anyone needs to leave now. Thank you. Just going back to the uh, top of the thread here in the chat window, um, there was a question about the DMP templates for Horizon Europe. Now, I must admit, I couldn't find an actual template for Horizon Europe specifically, but I know there was one from uh, Horizon 2020. Um, Jonathan, maybe you want to comment on that? Okay, sorry, my computer is... Uh overheating I can unmute myself uh, yes so on the very first slide uh, that I put in the um, if you go to the to the Nodo and download the um, presentation the very first slide has all those different links and one of them is the Horizon Europe uh, template also bear in mind that uh, if you use Argos or even uh, other type of um, DMP uh, software like DMP online is uh, used a lot or um, they also have uh, the templates, so you could just use that. Thank you. Uh, 
and just scrolling down. Right, um, Julia, another Julia asks, uh, could you articulate more on the other research outputs issue? What should be reported in that section and how should it be addressed? Um, other research outputs is anything that is, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, because it will really, really depend on your That's why I left on your you. project. So it's anything that you think might be relevant to other researchers to uh, validate your data or comprehend your data. For instance, the the um, one thing that comes in mind is if you're using a very specific type of equipment. You might want to add that if you're using a specific software you might add that um, it's very very broad and that's something that unfortunately it's difficult for me to give you a clear answer because it's it's more for the, yeah it's more for the research side so the researchers in me will will explain uh, will give you some example uh, for instance uh, um the reason uh, one of the reason why um from uh, the researchers we wanted more having uh, open science in place was that uh, there was this crisis of the um, reproducibility so what uh, when we are speaking about research uh, product we are uh, trying to make a context on uh, the research that is present in the articles because just uh, the contents of the article uh, even if uh, uh, usually they give you an overview, uh, they also have to be uh, summarized and uh, made for uh, um, for the context of uh, the article itself. But then if you want to reproduce, you may need the protocols. You may need the software that the person is using for processing the data. Uh, you maybe would like uh, to understand how uh, is uh, made the data sets, what were the outlier of uh, the data that were not, uh, uh, that were discarded for uh, which kind of reason or uh, uh, figures that didn't make uh, sense uh, to the researchers, but they make sense to you based on the instrument that you are using or uh, uh, I don't know, uh, for instance, if I use the microscope, the antibody, the type of light, uh, uh, the measurement that I'm taking, these are kind of information that help other researchers to reproduce uh, what was done and maybe to increase uh, the collaboration worldwide to make the data uh, much more valuable. So I hope that this may answer it to your question. Also, it, it doesn't have to be, I think one thing that the European Commission also emphasized, it doesn't have to link to be linked to any publication. So there could be some data that you got that you is not relevant enough to be created, done in a publication, but might still be relevant for the researchers. And so it's sharing that data that could be useful for others. It doesn't have to be linked to a publication anymore. Thank you both. Um, I'm just going to backtrack slightly and open the floor to um, Fotis. I think this is on the previous uh, subject. Fotis, do you want to unmute? Fotis? Yeah, it's because I had muted everyone. Ah, I'm sorry. To unmute. People okay. should be able to unmute now. Hello, right. you can you can hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, the uh, thank you very much first and foremost for the explanations. Uh, it makes a lot of sense so far. Uh, I think what and I'm not sure if I understood Julia's uh, response completely. Um, my my problem is with this, with the, with the second part, which is about the physical. Um, how do it? Uh, yeah new materials, antibodies, reagents, and samples. So I understand the whole reproducibility aspect in terms of how you 
produce a measurement with an instrument, for example, and how to, to document the whole process with contextual information and make that available. But I am not sure what to do with the physical aspect and when it comes to uh, samples, because um, the area we uh, I support, for example, is nanotechnology, and they produce some sort of, uh, you know, um, actual material in the end. But and when I see this definition within the other research outputs, that that makes it, makes it very confusing for me um, in terms of <laughs> I am not sure what's the framework here in terms of how to document, what to document, and whether we need to, um, how, how do I manage the physical properties of, of the samples? I, I don't understand how is that a DMP uh, relevant concept because all of these results, of course, all these, uh, let's say they produce a new, a new sort of material or uh, you know, a lighter material, whatever it is that they are trying to, to do. Um, then that's part of other deliverables probably within the project anyway. Uh, and all of this, of course, is commercially um, exploitable in the end. It's not just that uh, this is something to be made openly available. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand that part, that second part uh, okay. of, of the other research outputs. Thank you. Okay, so basically in uh, the DMP, uh, well, okay. In, in the DMP, it depends in which stage you are. If uh, you are on the level of the pro proposal, what you can uh, add is that uh, all the information about the data sets will be uploaded and you explain in which re repository. And this is at the level of the proposal. When uh, you are actually uh, working on uh, the uh, six months uh, DMP, and then if you want to update in the future, then what you can do is deposit your data sets in any repository that makes sense to you, uh, as Jonathan has showed before, either for uh, uh, any kind of data bank, uh, any kind of repository, and then you make uh, an explanation and you report back in the DMP. So what you are actually doing is a, a sort of link basically. So you have a data set with the metadata in which you are explaining uh, um, this is the protocol, for instance, if you, the, if you want to publish the protocol or if it's a protocol that you are reusing, you just put the citation in the link. Uh, then the data sets that you have, the instruments uh, you just put in the explanation, like in the description, uh, of the data sets and then uh, you upload the data sets. Usually this is better to do already in the node or in uh, other repository. Or uh, as I showed before, there is this possibility to publish uh, methods, uh, uh, data, notes and articles uh, in uh, Open Research Europe. Uh, and then you just link. You just say in the, in the DMP, you have just to mention that you are doing that. Not how, but it's what you're doing. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I understand that. What I said is about the physical samples. I, it's still not obvious to me about the physical samples. How is that manageable within the DMP? And actually, what am I supposed to, to request from the researchers to report well, when it comes to physical samples. That's linked also to good research data management best practices. So obviously we focus a lot on the digital objects, but if you have physical objects that has been, best practices have been, been done for much longer. So for instance, you would have unique IDs for each um, objects if you had the um, physical object. So for instance, that would be, you still have some uh, metadata linked to where is the, the where are the samples um, uh, when where physically can you find the samples uh, how many are there um, what's the temperature you're holding them at or you know or who's responsible of uh, all that all those elements that are linked uh, you would add that type of information uh, to it so obviously you're not going to deposit your physical objects inside a digital world, but 
you're informing of um, what exists, basically. So you don't need to list all the physical objects if that's not relevant, but you would give information about um, as much detail about those uh, physical uh, objects. I understand. I think we are still talking about producing a digital documentation, a, a list of metadata about uh, what yes. we know of the physical samples. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so basically, uh, for this, this can depend on a specific uh, type of uh, samples. For instance, uh, uh, when I was working uh, for blood samples, I, I also mentioned uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, samples will be uh, frozen and uh, defrosted and uh, keep, kept, and I was putting where I was keeping them, and for how long, and when I had to destroy them. So any kind of object, uh, you can uh, describe the life, and uh, this is just uh, for the reporting issue. So this okay. is part of good uh, research data management practice. And um, yes, it, it's all about the metadata, um, ultimately. I've, it, may I just suggest, Fotis, uh, just because this is taking quite a lot of time and there's a few other questions maybe to get through. If you want to get in touch with us, um, I think we'd yes, be definitely. happy to um, take you through this if, if you would like to do that. I'm just saying a question, could pictures yeah. be a kind of data for describing physical objects? Yes, definitely. They are there to do that data. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, so another question about uh, DMPs. Um, I would like to know if the DMP must be deposited in a repository with the CC license. I can't remember. <laughs> Um, what the European Commission uh, would like is that all this DMP will be published. This is something they want, uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, there are not uh, um, uh, rules uh, uh, in place. What we can suggest, uh, actually, uh, is uh, to publish the DMP and to publish in a different version. Uh, with Argos, it's possible to do automatically by clicking a button on the node. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, download the uh, DMP and uh, um, upload in uh, an archive and make it the DOI uh, visible and link uh, when you are reporting. And this is uh, something that the European Commission would like to have, but it's not mandatory. But do they have a recommended uh, license? I can't remember. Is it CC BY also, or everything should be open in the in theory? Yeah. Uh, but it's like uh, the other uh, research product. So at that point, also the DMP uh, publication will be another research product. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going through the chat, uh, con the conversation um, uh, in chronological order. There may be, I think there was actually at least one other DMP question, but uh, there's another question, which is, I think, more to do with Open Research Europe. Are associated partners obliged to publish in open access since they, in brackets, since they do not sign the grant agreement? Mm. Any publication which use um, EC money should be published open access, yes. But so it's not. not about who's involved, it's whether money from the EC was involved. As soon as you mention the acronym of uh, a funded project, you need to comply with uh, the requirements. Okay, great. It's not mandatory to, to do in uh, Open Research Europe, uh, as long as uh, it's an open access journal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, so another question, are researchers required to submit, so this is a DMP question, are researchers required to submit a final DMP at the end of their funded project? Yes. If yes, at what point must this be submitted, e.g. Um, along with the final project report? Again, that's a specific detail I cannot remember, I'm sorry. I would say it's six months after the end of the project, but I am not sure. It's basically as uh, as early as possible. So as soon as you finish the, the project ends, you should submit an updated version. But for the timing, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember. I don't I'm, remember. I'm not I even don't... sure they mentioned the specific uh, timeline, but I might be wrong. Yeah, but as part of good RDM, um, I certainly recommend per periodically updating the DMP. Um, th there's no hard and fast rules about this, but uh, I, I would say once a year, it's a good idea to revisit the DMP. But as for the final version, yes, I'm not absolutely sure about the Horizon Europe requirements, unfortunately. No, actually, yes, Fertis is right, uh, because uh, it's month 6, 24 and 48. So um, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, actually, when you're closing the report on the um, on the portal, the participant portal, you would need to upload the, the final DMP also. So it, uh, yes. it's, when you close uh, yeah. it, basically, you need to, to upload the DMP. I'm monitoring so. such a uh, project, ongoing project, and it is required by the end. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. In Horizon Europe, as, as well as in uh, Horizon 2020. Okay, thanks. Okay, brilliant. Um, just going through the chat further, and does it mean that if ORE is not an archive, the articles published there won't be stored long term. Does it meet the requirements of open access then? Yeah, I don't know if you remember one of my first slides uh, where we're saying that you always need to self archive, uh, except with Open Research Europe is the only one where they do it automatically for you, they will deposit on Zenodo. Um, so yes, it is long-term archived on the Zenodo. I'm sorry, actually someone else uh, answered that question. I didn't see that. Thank you to uh, Santi um, for also uh, confirming that. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I, I purposely <laughs> avoided trying to answer this question because I think this is a, a too far reaching question, but uh, how the issue of scientific quality and evaluation can be resolved with the platform, which alternative to impact factor exists? In terms of quantitative metrics? Um, I guess, it's, yeah. The, mm -hmm. the thing is, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm Specializing in open science, obviously I have thoughts on the subject, but in this specific context of the European Commission, it is not relevant because the European Commission will not judge on quantitative metrics. It will only judge on the qualitative aspects. So just for the sake of this webinar specifically, even if it's an interesting subject, I would say for Horizon Europe, it's not relevant because they do not judge on quantitative uh, metrics. Okay, thank you. Swiftly on, um, Alicia asks, um, is a data note like a data paper or is it something different? It's like a data paper, basically. It's uh, uh, an explanation of the data that uh, you are producing and uh, they can be peer reviewed. So you will have uh, also the approval or uh, anything that is related to the open peer review and uh, even the credit. And then uh, uh, it's just a brief report, let's say. 
Thanks, Julia. So, who is responsible for removing preprints which were rejected as a result of peer review? It's never removed. That's the whole point. You will get. Um, it's up to you as a researcher to, or as a reader, to make sure that what you're reading has been peer reviewed. And usually they say it. If you're on the preprint server, they will update with the final version usually, or forward to the on archive, for instance, they will forward you to the final version. On Open Research Europe, it's really easy, as Julia was showing, it's really easy to show, um, to see what's been, uh, it's not rejected because there's no rejection on Open Research Europe. It's just um, basically needs to be reworked. So you could see that a paper has received two, three negative reviews. But the, the point of, preprints is to accelerate knowledge sharing but a bit like any type of papers i mean even if a paper has been peer reviewed you still have a critical eye on on what was published i mean when i was doing my research there were some papers that you know they had been peer reviewed but <laughs> so you always have to that's linked to doing research i would say yeah, but I think nobody will like to have archived uh, somewhere uh, the rejected work be, be done. True. I think that's the one of the risks of sharing preprints. But at the same time, it also shows the process of how we do research. So it has some positive impact on avoiding mistakes that were done before because it could be rejected for various reasons and i still think a lot of the time it might be relevant and if it's a really really bad preprint it will be so badly referenced or so badly it won't appear in search engine as much as others so you will you will really need to dig to find it thanks of the open review is that uh, if uh, someone is commenting a preprint then uh, you can uh, directly communicate uh, with uh, uh, the peer review to, to understand how you can improve how, or uh, what was the misunderstanding because it's also true that sometimes uh, the peer review are coming from people that are not expert in uh, um, in what is said in the article. And um, having this kind of debates that are open and transparent is helping a lot the quality of the second version or of any kind of the version that will be uh, submitted. And this is something in principle beyond uh, uh, what is happening in Open Research Europe. This is like uh, the principle of uh, open science and uh, open peer review, in my opinion. I have another practical question about, yeah, uh, as scientists, we are obsessed about, uh, about having a high impact factor, uh, to our publication, how this can be uh, related to, uh, the requirements for open data publication. There are metrics that show that, um, opening up data does actually increase visibility and impact of, of the um, original data, actually. And um, this is something that we're trying to encourage as a consequence. And I, I, I fully agree, but normally when you are submitting uh, uh, proposals for funding, uh, maybe less for Europe, but for regional or national level, uh, it is a very important point to prove that the scientists uh, involved in these proposals uh, have already a very high impact factor because they published in very high ranked uh, journals. So uh, it will be ideal that uh, EU try to, to handle that, to do it for freely, but still covering the, the qualitative aspect. 
again, right. it's it's you know the issue is there are very interesting conversations to to be had, and there are a lot of working groups um, currently working on on those kind of um, questions, but unfortunately. Currently, we're bound to, or more, you're bound to what the current requirements are. And even if it would be or not, it could be argued in both ways, uh, useful. Right now, it's not considered. My point was just to help on developing new ways of seeing, not to, not to criticize, but to improve uh, for the best of uh, scientists and new money. Okay, we, we, we just have only a, literally you know, four minutes left and uh, we've got so many more questions to get through and I'm, I'm so sorry that we're not going to be able to get through them all, but maybe just let's take a, uh, well, let's package it into one question, but I think they're all about uh, Open Research Europe. Um, one question is about uh, publishing books, whether that's going to be possible on ORE. One is about uh, sensitive data, uh, because you can't do this on Zenodo, so what's the deal here with ORE? Uh, and another question also about uh, Open Research Europe is, um, is peer review only with proposed reviewers by the author, or will the platform look for reviewers as well? Seems a bit dubious, if not. So there are three questions there, but maybe that could see us through to the end of this session. Okay, I will try to be brief. Um, so I, I will go from uh, the end because it's the one that I remember in case I will ask again. Uh, okay, so the first was... Uh, um, so the last question was about uh, uh, if, uh, um, okay, usually in the platform, you can choose, uh, uh, you can indicate the reviewer that you would like to review your article, and then uh, you can uh, uh, find uh, an easy tool uh, in which uh, the tool is suggesting, uh, based on the keywords that you used in the paper, who could be uh, a person that uh, is uh, um, is more expert in uh, your uh, work? And you can check and you can say, yes, this person, yes, this person, no. So you actually can, uh, can choose based on the relevance. And this was uh, the question about the peer review. Can you remember? Uh, sensitive data. Sensitive data, uh, as I showed uh, in uh, my presentation, I would recommend to download uh, Amnesia and uh, work on it because it helps you uh, to anonymize the data and, that, uh, that, and eliminate, let's say, or don't show what is sensitive and uh, uh, enable you to publish at the end. Uh, in in the node or another uh, archive the sensitive data and uh, if uh, there are too many sensitive data that you can't really show you can just uh, mention like a description that you have collected this kind of data and that uh, there are deposits somewhere and that's all yeah if i can add on this is um you can always restrict access on the node because remember the principle is as open as possible as close as necessary um, but you always have to at least make the metadata available so you would still need to deposit information on the node that you have that data even if you're not actually depositing the data on the node so you can still make it findable for others but not accessible to to others if it's sensitive data Thank you. And the, and the other question was about books. Ah, yes, so you can publish books and the same. That's a quick answer. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That really is the end of the session. And we will collect all the, the chat and the questions that are there. Uh, we will somehow try to uh, figure out a way to answer this as well. Um, but I would like to thank 
Julia and Jonathan. I think that was a great session. And thank you to the audience for all the wonderful conversation and um, all the questions. And hopefully we'll be able to somehow communicate more of these, the answers to these um, through open air website or some means anyway. Um, we will also be sharing the slides and the recording of the session. So you will be able to revisit this. Um, so thank you again, and um, we hope to see you again. And this session will be repeated periodically um, for I don't know how long, but we will be doing it again um, next year. And uh, we, if you know anyone else that may want to join us on this, then please do share uh, share with them. So thank you and. Um, Goodbye for now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And thanks, Venkat, for 